forward. Um, today, uh, in our Inca seminar series, we welcome Matteo Michel Walters from University of Copenhagen, uh, who received his uh, PhD in Trieste and worked on the intersection of condensed matter, and uh, computational physics, and later quantum annealing and machine learning. Uh, please take it away. Okay, so thank you very much for this uh, invitation and opportunity. So uh, today I will talk about a small project we carried out last year about the marriage of uh, Monte Carlo research and quantum annealing. And I did this work with uh, Evert, which now works at the University of Leiden. And uh, recently, uh, students from Copenhagen University, Andoni, also joined and uh, is currently working on some related stuff. So, okay. This is a brief outline of, uh, of the talk. Of course, I will start the introduction and motivation. And then since this indeed was a, a small project, I will mainly focus on explaining what Monte Carlo research is and how it can be used in the context of uh, quantum annealing. And then show some benchmarks on uh, satisfiability problems and uh, max cut. And then I will discuss some of the possible outlook and how this approach can be used in practice or improved. So, but first, uh, let's talk briefly about the true motivation of this work. So the concept I will be explaining uh, have been introduced in this article, which appeared on Natural Machine Intelligence, uh, Machine Intelligence last year. And uh, Ebert and I were asked to uh, write a reusability report, which is a short article in which we uh, they asked to use the code written by someone else and play with it. So try to understand it and see uh, if this can be easily modified and applied on, uh, on different problems. And the take home message uh, is that, um, so in the original article, they claim that MCTS is better than gradient descent for optimizing uh, uh, an init schedule. You, uh, I will, uh, of course, explain this a little bit better, better in the, the following. And that if you add neural networks on top of MCTS, which is a very standard approach, then this is an extremely efficient method for optimizing annealing paths. We mainly focused on the MCTS part, which is what I'm going to talk about. And our conclusion is that instead, typically gradient descent is better than MCTS, but nevertheless, MCTS uh, is useful in its own way. So, now, uh, I guess that everybody here is very familiar with these concepts, but I will briefly go through them just to fix some notation. Uh, although annealing uh, is not restricted to combinatorial optimization, here I will focus uh, on this kind of problem, which are classical problems that can be stated as the minimization or the optimization of classical cost function defined on uh, binary variables. And we want to tackle this problem by using of quantum mechanics. So of course, what we do is we give heads to the binary variables, transforming them in operators in the specific in Pauli matrices and associate to the classical cost function, uh, what I will call uh, a problem Hamiltonian, which is diagonal in the computational basis which is, the, is constituted by the bit strings, basically. Now, uh, the idea behind quantum annealing is that now we make use of a further Hamiltonian, which I will call the mixing Hamiltonian, and then through an interpolation, time-dependent interpolation between the problem and the mixing Hamiltonian, the objective of annealing is driving the system from an easy to prepare ground state, which is the ground state of the mixing Hamiltonian, to an unknown state, which instead minimizes the problem Hamiltonian. 
And of course, in order to do that, the mixing Hamiltonian must have some uh, uh, properties. Uh, it must not commute with the problem Hamiltonian. And then uh, it's called mixing because um, it must um, apply I mean, the, 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 the matrix of some power of this, the matrix elements of some power of this Hamiltonian between two different um, basis states must not be zero so that it can induce some dynamics. Of course, uh, one of the main bottleneck of all these adiabatic approaches is that when we drive the system to during this interpolation, uh, typically we encounter small gaps between the ground state that we are trying to follow and the excited state manifold. And the smaller these gaps, the longer the evolution time we need in order to prepare with a good uh, accuracy the ground state. And a typical problem in which these um, appear is the Grover search problem, which is of particular interest also because um, it's one of the few cases in which there is uh, a quantum speed up that can be analytically demonstrated. And indeed, also with quantum or with adiabatic approach, we can find this uh, quantum speed up, which however, depends crucially on the shape of this time dependent schedule S of T. So if we use the easiest, most uh, say naive choice, which is just a linear interpolation between zero and one, then the time we need to, the, the runtime of the algorithm that we need in order to arrive at the ground state scales, scales as the inverse of the gap square, which in this case is um, exponentially large. In the, in the number of, of variables. However, if we perform a smart optimization of this uh, time-dependent schedule S, we can reduce this constraint uh, to the um, a time, uh, a runtime that scales as the inverse of the gap. This is still exponential, but nevertheless, it displays a quadratic speed up with respect to the linear schedule, which instead has a same performance of a um, classical algorithm. Um, however, the core idea behind this schedule optimization is that if you know the spectrum, you know where the gap will be minimum, and then you can slow down close to the minimum gap, such that you can go fast where you can go fast, and then you slow down where you need to go slow. Similarly, similarly to what we do when we drive and uh, there is a curve on the street. However, in practical uh, problems, we don't have any spectral information. In particular, if we don't know, I mean, if we already knew the ground state and the spectrum, we already solved the problem. So when we want to apply quantum annealing to solve problems of which we don't know the ground state, we don't even know where there is a gap closing. So we can't use spectral information to optimize the schedule. And here comes the idea of, um, of MCTS. So schedule optimization, as we just discussed, is crucial for quantum annealing, both for reducing non-adiabatic errors, so slowing down um, when there is a small gap, and also to reduce boundary errors. So the fact that finite speed at the end of the schedules introduces additional error if we've done well so far. And also we would like to reduce as much as possible the runtime because when we apply quantum annealing on realistic hardware, then we have uh, the coherence taking place and the longer the runtime, the larger will be the final error due to indeed hardware noise. But indeed all these requires some spectral information, especially the one regarding non adiabatic errors. So, um, a possible way to avoid the use of um, spectral information is parameterize the schedule with some uh, um, variational, uh, uh, with a variational structure. So we decompose our, um, our schedule with a sum of functions of fixed, uh, we choose a basis for this, um, for the schedule with uh, uh, some amplitudes uh, which here I call small a of m, which will be 
are variational parameters. And the only constraint that we have is that the schedule must interpolate between zero and one in order to drive the system from the initial to the final Hamiltonian. And then that these sets of functions must be a good basis for our um, um, a reduced basis for our um, uh, annealing schedule S. And then we can compute the expectation value of the problem Hamiltonian after we evolved the system using this, um, this schedule and then minimize this, uh, this uh, expectation value with respect to the variational parameters A. Now, if we want to minimize a classical function of a few parameters, uh, maybe not a few, but let's say a number of, par of parameters, then we have two main approaches. We can use a gradient-based approach or gradient-free approaches. And among gradient-free approaches, one that has been uh, particularly popular in the last years is indeed Monte Carlo research. So, uh, and this algorithm in particular proved to be extremely powerful in uh, um, behind the um, artificial intelligence approach to board games like uh, Go or chess, which are both based, so the algorithm AlphaGo and AlphaZero are both based on Monte Carlo research. So what is Monte Carlo research? Let's assume now that we have a board game or any decision process in which we have a set of turns, which are labeled by a discrete index. And in each of these turns, the, the state of your, of your board game or of your system is uh, uh, described indeed by a particular configuration or a particular state. And then depending on the state you're in, you can perform a given set of actions that transform your old state in the new state of the next turn. Then when you perform all the possible action and you go through the turns in this board game language, at the end of the tree, you will reach a node which cannot be expanded any further. So the, the game is ended and then you will get a reward. And this reward can be a number or simply uh, win or lost. And then one can ask, is there a clever way to explore this tree, which you can easily understand gets uh, exponentially large, the, the deeper and the wider it is, in order to uh, find good strategies? Especially if these good strategies are hard to find. And so it's if you just perform a random uh, exploration, it's much easier to find a bad strategy that will lead you to a loss than a good strategy that uh, will lead you to a win. So again, naive approach is just do a brute force search. So exhaust all, all possibilities, which of course will find the optimal strategies, but also is exponentially hard in the, um, uh, in the size of the tree. So uh, it gets rapidly unfeasible. A possible alternative, which indeed works very well and is extremely popular for this kind of problem, is Monte Carlo research, which lies on the idea of sampling the possible paths that stem from a given state. So let's look a little bit more in detail about, on, about Monte Carlo research. So each cycle of this, uh, of this algorithm is composed in four steps. There is a selection step, an expansion, a simulation, and a backpropagation. So let's start for the moment from a tree which is partially expanded. This tree will consist in some parent nodes, which are the one at the top that has some moves expanded on the bottom. So for instance, the first no node that you see here is a parent node with three children nodes. And the children, nodes that are not expanded, so the terminal nodes of this tree, are called leaf nodes. Each node has two scores, two is characterized by two numbers, which is a total score, um, which represents how good that node is. So basically, um, 
if you want to um, find a good strategy, how likely is that you will pass through that node? And then a number of visits, which means during your search in the tree, how many times you passed through that node. And once we have this partially expanded tree, which can also consist in a single node, we first go in the selection step, which means that we need to select one of the leads nodes, which is not yet expanded, and expand it. How is this chosen? It's chosen by what is known as UCB potential of the node, which tries to balance between exploitation, so going through nodes that has um, a high score, so they are likely to lead to good results, and exploration. And if you look at the exploration term, you see that um, it's, it gets larger if the parent node is visited many times, while the children node is not. So if there is a node that, um, a parent node that is visited many times, but one of, of its children has never been visited, then the Monte Carlo researcher will try to, ex to expand it to see if there are good strategies there. And this constant C, is used to balance between the exploitation and the exploration terms, and is typically used as a square root of two, because you can show that this is close to an optimal value. So we have our tree, and as a first step, we need to select which node to expand, a leaf node to expand. Then second step, expansion. This is very simple. We perform a move or a set of move, and we look at the possible children. So we are enlarging our tree. And depending on the size of, uh, on the number of possible uh, actions at each step, we can either choose a random children or go through all of them. For the moment, let's just focus on one. So uh, we had our tree, we reached a, a leaf node with, with the largest UCB potential, and then we expanded one children. And the next step, and here it's where the Monte Carlo comes into play, we will perform a set of random rollouts. Basically, we now want to understand how good is this uh, new node. So what the algorithm does is perform a set of random actions until it reaches a terminal node where it gets a reward. In this case, it might be just, uh, but just one. And so uh, this is a two player game uh, represented by black, by the say darker nodes and whiter nodes. We expand the nodes, we do one rollout and we find that white wins. So we have performed a possible simulation. We have uh, predicted a possible future stemming from that node and obtained the associated reward. Then we need to propagate back this information up all the path taken so far. So what we do is we update the number of visits of each parent node. And in this case, which is a two player game, we improve only the score of the white player nodes. So the black player lost, its, uh, it's, uh, its score does not improve, the white player instead wins and so its score improves. And now, if you if you see the for each parent node, the number of visit is equal to the number of visit of all its children nodes. And the while the number the score must be larger than the sum of the score of the of its children. So once we have performed one of these steps, we can repeat many times either just by repeating the rollout many times so that we have a better estimate of the, of the value of a given node or just to expand the tree. And then uh, we stop this process when we decided either that we are uh, happy with the result or we can uh, set up at the beginning a given uh, number of iteration, a given computational cost that we are willing to pay in order to search through this tree. Now, how can this be used in the context of uh, quantum annealing? The idea is to use MCTS as a gradient-free method to optimize the schedule. And here we have uh, two possible ways. On one side, we can discretize the schedule 
in a number of uh, m step and then for each step assign um, also discretize the possible value that s can take between zero and one in this case we have a sort of uh, checkboard and the role of mcts is at each step to choose which value of s must be chosen in order to uh, minimize the, the energy with a fixed annealing time. And this, of course, has connection with um, QAOA and other variational quantum algorithms. On the other hand, we can instead, uh, as I suggested before, parameterize the schedule with a given set of function, and then use MCTS to find a minimum in this space of the amplitude of this function. A possibility, which is the one uh, they chose in, uh, in this paper, is using uh, a set of um, harmonics on top of a linear schedule. Here, a, uh, of course, the, the frequency, we have M, capital M frequencies, which are the harmonics of the uh, related to the kneeling time uh, tau. And um, uh, each amplitude is discretized in a set of L possible actions. Of course, one may wonder uh, how this discretization affects the final, um, uh, the final accuracy of the algorithm. And this is something that we have to take into account when we compare instead with uh, gradient descent with the same problem. So uh, again, uh, the problem they chose and that we also used as a benchmark is just um, uh, Boolean satisfiability, in this case, TRISAT. And the idea, the problem of TRISAT consists in, you have N Boolean variables, so it means that you have two to the N possible combinations. And then you have a cost function, which consists in the, um, um, in a logical end of a number of clauses, where each clauses is instead uh, a logical or of three, elements which are either a bit or its negation. And the number of clauses is typically proportional to the number of logical uh, of uh, Boolean variables. Uh, this problem has been studied a lot and it's known that there is a phase transition between a satisfiability region and a region where this uh, Hamiltonian cannot be satisfied. And it's of particular interest because it's one of the NP complete problem. So of course, uh, understanding how quantum annealing uh, works in this case is an interesting uh, problem. And for this benchmark, we chose uh, alpha equal three, which is still in the easy case where there is a single um, basis state that satisfies all the clauses, but it's still hard for uh, annealing because typically the gaps are very small or better there is a combination of hard instances where the gap is very small and easier instances where the gap instead is larger and also linear schedule uh, is fine. And now if we want to go quantum, we add the heads on the our binary variables and we use as the mixing Hamiltonian just a transverse field uh, chosen with this particular form so that the spectrum is positive. And uh, um, the, the problem Hamiltonian is just the sum of the bit string that satisfies, that corresponds to the, or the projector of, on the bit string that satisfy the clauses, such that the energy is just the number of violated clauses of each uh, bit string. Now, this is a sort of overview of the result that you get if you try to apply this schedule optimization on, uh, on TRISAT. So let's first focus on the picture on the, on the left. Here we show the um, performance of linear quantum annealing, meaning that we just use a linear um, uh, interpolation for the schedule S of T. And the error bar are only due to the different performance on different uh, TRISAT instances. And then we compare uh, a gradient descent approach, in this case, the BFGS algorithm and the Monte Carlo research. And as you see, BFGS is typically slightly better, but more or less on average, they perform similarly. 
And uh, if we want to understand the, um, um, the difference in performance, if we look at the um, individual cases, we can see that in some, in some situation, the linear annealing does just fine, which is the case of the easy instances. In the intermediate cases, schedule optimization, either with BFGS or MCTS, is crucial to get a better result. And in some cases, instead, which are the hardest one, even if you optimize the schedule, uh, it's hard to get a good uh, fidelity at the end of the infidelity in this case, at the end of the, uh, of the process. Now, to see which kind of solutions MCTS finds, we will just briefly focus on the intermediate case. And when the annealing time is very large, what it does is precisely slowing down close to the minimum gap. So um, on the left, you see the spectrum of, this, of the, the, lowest, you know, the lowest five uh, eigen, eigen values of the Hamiltonian, the independent Hamiltonian, as we um, drive the system from the mixing Hamiltonian to the prominent Hamiltonian. And as you see, there is uh, indeed a small gap appearing. When we look at the optimized schedule for a larger annealing time, we see that this schedule is indeed slowing down in the presence of the gap. And if we, if we now plot again the spectrum as a function of time, but with the optimized schedule, we see that there is this plateau emerging when the gap is closed. So the, the now as a function of time, the region in which the gaps remain small is longer. And then the optimized schedule is able to drive the system to a much better uh, energy with respect to what a linear annealing does. We can see something similar also when we use a shorter annealing time where it's not possible to find a good adiabatic path, but still uh, MCTS is able to find good diabatic paths. So in this case, you see that the, um, the minimum gap is crossed three times by the schedule. And if you look at the expectation value of the energy as a function of time with this optimized schedule, you see that indeed it crosses three times this minimum gap, but it does so um, in such a way that it gets excited in the first time while it uses the third uh, avoided crossing in order to go back as much as possible towards the ground state. Basically, is exploiting Landau Zener processes in a clever way. Of course, uh, this is much higher energy with respect to the previous case, but still is, uh, it's better than what a linear annealing does. Uh, how much time do I have left? Well, I think you can talk for 15 more minutes if you want. Okay. Then I can going on. Okay. Uh, now the question is, um, so we saw that at least for the data I showed you before, which were, uh, I think I forgot to mention for five frequency components, uh, the FGS, so a gradient descent and MCTS behaved in a similar way. Now we can ask, how many uh, frequencies do we need for this kind of schedule of optimization? And if there is any uh, difference in performance between the two, the two approaches. And in this case, you see that if we look uh, in the top left, if we use the FGS, the, the performance is rather independent from the number of frequencies. So this is probably a very bad basis choice because if you improve the, the, the number of harmonics that you're using, you're not really helping the algorithm in getting better, better schedules. And in particular from CTS, we can see uh, that the accuracy even decreases as a number of, um, of frequency components, even though this is more likely due to the fact that the um, convergence criteria uh, is satisfied even when the final fidelity is not so, so large. In this case, as convergence criteria, we chose either um, an infidelity of 1% uh, or uh, basically we are checking whether 
the optimization gets stuck somewhere and if it's stuck, we say after a while, stop trying to improve. And if you look at the cost of this uh, function of, the, um, of this uh, optimization by measuring the number of function evaluations that we need, we see that uh, BFGS, of course, needs more function evaluations, the larger the number of frequency components, because that means that there are more parameters and to reconstruct the gradient uh, with the finite differences, you need to sample the, um, the, the energy landscape in more points. And there is also an increase in complexity, an increase in the number of uh, function evaluations that you need as you increase the um, annealing time, even though there is a sort of plateau emerging. And this is probably uh, when the annealing time is large enough such that there are many paths that leads to good solutions. If we look at MCTS instead, uh, here the data are a little bit uh, weirder and harder to um, interpret, but beside uh, the tree with the uh, very small, uh, the smallest number of frequency components, we see that the performance uh, for the other is independent, both from the annealing time and from the number of frequencies. What this is telling us is that um, with a, uh, indeed, um, time and number of frequency independent cost, it's getting stuck in a local minima which is uh, uh, getting worse and worse as the number of frequency component increases, especially if the, num if the evolution time is not particularly large. However, if you change the convergence criteria, it gets better, although it is also uh, more expensive. So for sure, MCTS per se is not um, a cheap way to optimize um, a multivariate function. However, as the authors of the original paper uh, also showed, if you um, uh, enhance MCTS with neural networks, this can be much faster because you don't need to sample possible futures so many times as you do for um, naive, say, uh, vanilla MCTS. So uh, just to conclude, we benchmarked the same idea also on MaxCAT problem. In this case, on regular graphs with three edges on each vertex and uniform couplings. Uh, just as a check that the results that we got were not um, specific for uh, uh, trace out problems. And indeed, we observe similar results where gradient descent is uh, again the best choice followed by MCTS, which is, however, able to um, improve over a simple linear schedule. So uh, take on messages. Schedule optimization is extremely important in quantum annealing, but this is, uh, is nothing new. And if you, if you have a clever parameterization for this, um, for this for the schedule so that you can perform an optimization in um uh, in a parameter space in a finite parameter space if you can use the gradient use them because they will be for sure better than mcts unless uh, the the energy landscape is really pathological however computing gradients can be hard especially if you have some noise on top of your um, the on top of your award, so when you compute the expectation value of your of the problem Hamiltonian, you typically don't expect to have it clean, but there will be some noise due to uh, the the coherence and hardware noise, and so MCTS can be helpful because uh, that relies only on a sort of average. Um, reward for a given path, it doesn't need to be perfect, and is able to find both adiabatic and diabatic paths to optimize the annealing schedule, depending on the amount of time that you're willing to spend in the, in the algorithm. And it's also easy to 
uh, adapt to different problems and to enhance indeed with the neural network, which is the idea behind the success of AlphaGo and AlphaZero. The tree is always there because the tree is the structure of the decision process. But then instead of sampling many possible futures with uh, Monte Carlo runs, you use neural networks to both evaluate the, um, the quality of a given node and telling the algorithm which node to expand next. And in particular, you can train the neural network either against another neural network on a set of data that you already have, and then it can easily um, be adapted on a known problem with a much uh, smaller computational cost with respect to MCTS alone. Then, of course, you can use different parameterization for the, for the schedule. Indeed, the one that we chose uh, was not a um, particularly clever choice. And a possibility, for instance, is to use CRAB, uh, where we have randomized frequency, which is known that is a very successful way to, for optimal control. And then one can also think of uh, further roles from CTS. So not only or not at all optimizing a schedule, but optimizing uh, other parameters that enter into um, uh, an annealing process, which this may be, for instance, choosing appropriate counter diabetic driving to speed up the annealing process, or uh, uh, choose the order in which perform any sort of action that you can discretize in a, in a search space. And then, of course, uh, uh, one can also think of using MCTS on circuit-based uh, quantum algorithm, so variational quantum algorithm, as an alternative to uh, gradient descent searches of the, of the, of the optimal parameters. And uh, with that, I will uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for uh, the great talk. Um, while well, people are thinking about the questions, uh, I will ask my own. Um, so there are a few things I wanted to uh, make sure that I understood correctly or just uh, ask for clarification. So one is that the, when you described this tree structure, you were talking about binary variables, but you were, what you were actually working with were uh, real numbers, right? Yeah, yeah, no. So this is, these are not necessarily binary variables. So what we do in this case is we, um, the tree, the, this um, search space is not the uh, logic, so the, the Boolean variables, but is in the choice of the amplitudes of the, um, let's say, of the basis function for the schedule. So uh, if we go here what we want to do is use mcts to find the optimal choice of this am so instead of considering a continuous this am to line in a continuous space we discretize them in a given um, interval and then now we have m possible uh, m uh, m turns so m will be the capital m will be the depth of our game, and on each turn we will have L possible choices, where this L is the number of discretizations that we chose for each of these uh, coefficients A. And now uh, here it's like there are only two, but you can think that this tree can have many more branches. So every node, like instead of just having two child ch children, will have L of them. And in the specific in our case, every node has 40 children. So you can also see that the, the tree becomes uh, rapidly very big because uh, the total possible number of possible parts is four to the, 40 to the n. Thanks. Now oh, there is a question. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm uh, Kathy McGue. I I work for D-Wave. Um, I guess I have uh, two, one, maybe two questions, depending on the first one. Uh, does this 
is there anything uh, specific to quantum annealing that this uh, makes this work? I mean, wouldn't this work as a way to choose a path for simulated annealing or, or any other kind of a heuristic search that uh, so, that has something like a like a path structure mm -hmm. to it? Yeah. Is there any anything wrong with doing that? No, I would say no, unless the the path is extremely unstructured. So uh, we are trying now to apply the same idea to um, um, QIOA. And our preliminary results, which are extremely preliminary, shows that MCTS is, is uh, much worse in finding good QIOA parameters with respect to annealing uh, in, with this kind of setup. And a possible explanation is that in QIOA, you have many paths where uh, if you look at subsequent parameters, they are uncorrelated from each other. So right, if you just right. look at a set of, of, um, of parameters from an optimal path, they look like a random number. And so for MCTS, it becomes very hard to exclude part of the tree where it is sure that going there is a bad decision. Uh, while MCTS relies on that. So MCTS relies that um, when you start expanding the tree, you find some nodes which are clearly bad choices. So there is no point in looking what lies behind there because you arrive at the node, you perform a few uh, random rollouts until the end, and then you see that there you always lose. You always get a terrible reward. So, okay, there might be a good path down there, but it's very unlikely. So you can uh, prune off the uh, part of the tree and focus somewhere else where it's more likely to have uh, nice solutions. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Um, and I think you've answered my other question too. I, and it was about this, these, uh, these rewards. Like, really, if you don't, if you don't know the the ground state, if you don't, if you don't know, you get to the leaf node, and you have a number, but you don't know at the beginning whether it's a good number or a bad number. Yeah, you yeah, but actually, you can use uh, you can use, for instance, the minus the expectation value of the energy. So you I'm know. Sorry, the minus. So if you if you want to find the ground state of a given Hamiltonian, you evaluate the energy at the end. And even if you don't know its ground state, you know that this the lower the energy, the closer you are better. to the ground. State. Yeah. So so that's what you kind of do, uh, given the fact that you don't know what the ground state is, you you don't mark them win or lose. I found a ground state, I didn't. Yes, you just exactly. mark them better, better or worse and and propagate that up. Yeah, so yeah. okay, so then then my question is, what's why not just do your Monte Carlo search? You found some states uh, all the way, and you've got a best one, and you just call it you're done. why Why bother to follow up with uh, with quantum annealing, you've spent all this time and you've found some good states and uh, you know, what, what's the, I guess you're trying to learn a good path, but if this is an input and you've found some good answers to the input, what's the point of learning the good path? Well, but the, the Monte Carlo is not done in the, in the physical space. So here the, the rollouts are not in the space of- Okay, um, okay. all right. Of qubits. Right. You're, you're, uh, because you've discretized your, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not doing this parameters. search in the cube, in the, in the qubit space, let's say, or in the binary variable space, but I'm doing this search in the, in the parameter space, which are the, are my variational parameter for the schedule. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I had another quick question. Uh, which is that uh, you had only one sentence in the conclusions about neural networks, mm -hmm. which felt, uh, I guess, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I, I guess I wanted to hear more. And specifically, it was not super clear to me um, since you said that you, you're not actually using the, uh, the sampling anymore, right? So does this neural network search for the best schedule even need the the output of a quantum computer at any point or only during training? Uh, so uh, this uh, the whole idea here lies on the fact that we have an annealer. So uh, again, the the search is not in the, um, the qubit space, but in the 
parameter space that is used to define a certain naming schedule. And also the neural network does that. So the annealer here is what does is what provides the reward. Without the annealer, we don't have access to the reward. The, this whole constructor is a, is a classical uh, optimization feedback, if you want, that tries to guide the annealer in order to reduce as much as possible the any sort of error that is due to the schedule choice. Now, for the specific, what you can use neural network for is to look at a tree and predict how good is to choose uh, so a partially expanded tree and choose how good is um, uh, expanding a given node, looking at the, uh, the, the values of the other nodes. So instead of, uh, if, you, if you go back, uh, if we go back here, so MCTS relies on the fact that you use Monte Carlo rollouts to um, both evaluate the, the average score for a node and then to uh, increase its visits. And these are used to select which nodes to expand later on. Now, if you have a way to predict the score of a node without doing many random rollouts, then you gain a lot of time. And that's where um, the neural network comes, uh, comes into play. The neural network uh, is trained on a set of uh, expanded tree, and then tries to understand, given a certain path, whether it can say if that path uh, is going to give a good or bad reward. For instance, um, if, we, if a certain path, uh, let's go, uh, let's go here. So if a certain path, for instance, is uh, associated to a schedule that goes very slow for a while, then crosses the minimum gap extremely fast, and then slows down again, then the, the role of the neural network is understanding that that is a poor choice, and that is a poor choice for any kind of annealing problem you're going to solve. You don't need to sample paths that are similar to that one in order to understand that that choice is bad. And that's why neural network can speed up the search process because they can learn some structure uh, present in the, in the path and uh, understand and uh, yeah, understand whether they are good choices or not, and then save them as information that can be reused many times. While uh, a given um, MCTS, it starts always from scratch. So you, have, you start expanding the node, at the end you have a um, strategy, but then if you want to use MCTS again, you need to start, start from scratch again. So uh, just to make sure, there is a bigger kind of problem, which is the problem family, and you're training your neural network not on a single instance of uh, optimization problem, but on a problem family. And then you, you're a, so even though the training takes a long time, you are able to use that neural network for a particular yes. instance of that problem family. And exactly. so my question was, well, during the actual usage, right, when we have a specific instance and we want to solve it, mm -hmm. and for that we want to find the best schedule, do you need the actual uh, reward function? To find the schedule, or at that point, you only rely on your network. Well, it depends. It depends if you want to uh, retrain your neural network or not. If you are just happy with the neural network you have, then the neural network is just telling you at each step um, which action to perform. So it creates a path for you, and that's all. Then, since every neural network has some um, uh, say randomicity in them. So meaning that uh, they never give exactly the same answer, but rather give a spectrum of possible answers centered on some, uh, on some uh, mean. You can run the, 
this uh, neural network optimization several times and then extract a sort of probability distribution of the of your reward if instead you want to sp specialize your network for a given problem you can run it a few times uh, trying to favor more exploration than exploitation and then uh, um, we say retrain its uh, its parameters in order to learn better to solve a specific instance but it's still faster than doing it from scratch because you don't need to simulate many many times your problem in order to reconstruct from zero the um, uh, the energy landscape but maybe you just need to optimize a little bit some parameters such that uh, it gets better at a specific problem. Thanks. Uh, are there any further questions? Okay, I could ask one. Um, go ahead. Okay, so go back to the tree set slide. Mm. Yes with the tree on it uh, which one well you've actually got a tree yeah back there that one that will do okay so you have um so when what's the relationship between a monte carlo tree search and a branch and bound algorithm are they very similar algorithms or like the same name for different things yes. what's the second one sorry Branch and bound. Uh, I'm not familiar with it, so. Uh, okay, because you branch and bound is an algorithm, a classical algorithm that looks very like this, that will solve these kind of optimization problems better than guessing, right? So. But, yeah, it, it might be that they are related. I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I think that M MCTS uh, is a, a uh, new name given to an older idea. Yeah. But I feel like the core difference is that you are not trying to actually bound anything rigorously. So your your score is not rigorous. So even if you found a score that is W, maybe there is still a solution in that branch that you just missed. Uh, so in some sense, it's uh, it's more of a guesswork than the branch and bound. Okay, that's that's a good that that that's a good thing because mm -hmm. I'm trying to see we now have and now when we look at this if you're doing Monte Carlo tree search every does every one of those circles that now has a number in it mm -hmm. like if every time you need a um you need to understand the score that's an annealer run Yes. No. 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 So, uh, where does the and, score come from? And then the, so uh, the score comes from annealing rounds that updates the score, all the the tree from the leaf node until the end. So okay, but you need an, but you have every time you for every every roll up every cycle you will have an annealing run to up yes, update those yes, yes. Exactly, exactly okay because i'm trying to understand the total cost of what you're doing um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah yeah the the total cost is uh i mean in the what i showed here this mm -hmm. is the total the total function evaluations that we use for this uh, specific problem um, hang on, which of the graphs? The... the I mean, the two bottom graphs yeah. are the number of function evaluations mm -hmm. for each optimization, which means either a local search in uh, using the gradient descent or one single Monte Carlo tree search. Okay, so basically we have we have hundreds there. Now, what size are these problems? So uh, we're using 11 um, okay, logical and... variables. Mm -hmm. So the Hilbert space is uh, 2 to the 11 is 2048. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, then we have 40 choices 
each for each frequency components. And here the frequency components goes from uh, three to nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got you. So in this specific, if if you were to ask me, uh, would you suggest to use MCTS for this specific problem? I would say no, because yeah, no, no, it's yeah. no, it, it's not particularly well suited for for this kind of problem because you have other other algorithms that work. I would say relatively better. But then, if for instance in this case, if you can't access the um, the the gradients because you have noise on top of your reward so um, you, you can't use the gradient and and maybe to uh, optimize with a better parameterization in your schedule you need more points more more frequency or more say, more components more parameters then mcts could be a reasonable choice at least one of the many and its main advantage is that it can be easily uh, enhanced with neural networks, which is where really MCTS shines. Okay, yeah, no, I see. Because we now have three, we have two classical and one quantum way to try to solve a problem. And I'm trying to see whether we've solved the problem several times classically, but just not recognize this, or whether we actually then need to do the quantum bit. Um, just in terms of resources used. And I think it hinges on whether you can then reuse stuff for many new instances. Yeah, of and that, that, that's where that's near where the neural networks come into place. That yeah. saves you quantum resources because you, you can train it initially with quantum resources, but then when you want to solve a specific instance, you don't need to um, rerun your quantum algorithm so many times as you would need with MCTS or with a uh, gradient descent starting from random point in space. Yeah, okay. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, I think I have the, the whole thing put together a bit better now. Thank you. Well, with that, let's conclude the today's uh, seminar. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week. Thank you very much and goodbye.